Thank you. All right, show of hands. Who here has uh, done character art before? All right, and if you can keep your hands raised as I tick off some topics, uh, who here has done rigging before? Okay, uh, and who here has uh, completed that full pipeline, gone into animation? All right, very cool. Um, is there anyone here that would consider themselves an absolute beginner? Can you change hands? <laughs> cool, all right, a nice mix. All right. Yeah, we're gonna use it when people are in the motion capture suits. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Of course, uh, I need this guy. Does it work? Ha, ha, ha. All right. This slide was supposed to be up eight minutes ago. So instead of five minutes for muster, it looks like everyone is here. I'm going to find a nice, comfortable spot to address everyone. I'm going to move the awkwardly placed chair, which I was going to use to record. I'm going to place it over here. It'll be our prop chair. I might even stand in front of that lovely fan. I promise that won't happen again either. All right, good morning everyone. My name is Connor Penhale. Um, uh, by trade, I'm a software guy. I'm a, I self-describe as a queer working professional, AKA suspiciously wealthy furry. Um, so yeah, uh, I consider myself an artist. That's my hobby. Uh, organizing the fandom is something I'm very passionate about. Uh, and as a fan, I am very into furry and cyberpunk. I use he, him pronouns. And uh, this is Ruxbat. That's my fursona. Uh, that's me on top of Winella Pass in Denver, Colorado, my hometown. Um, and uh, unlike me, he has real hobbies. He doesn't work all the time and instead goes hiking, enjoys himself, doesn't work for a month at a time on a slide deck. Uh, also uses uh, he, him pronouns. I've been in the fandom since about 2007 um, and I'm really happy to be here today addressing all of you. Uh, today we're gonna go over a brief agenda. Um, pardon the blurry background as the Wi-Fi loads the cool videos I made. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we've been, uh, our Queer Art Collective has been using the Rococo motion capture system for about the last two years, and we've been using hacky other things for the last one. Uh, we're gonna be going over the lessons that we've learned the hard way. Uh, the hard way being is that none of us have a formal education or training on uh, animation or any of these things. All we have is a tenacity to work very long hours. Um, so, uh, after the hour lecture, I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. Uh, we're gonna have 20 minutes dedicated to Q&A while I set up the lab environment, which is the longest part of this. Come on, Wi-Fi. All right, um, yeah, so there are two Rococo motion capture suits at the front of the classroom, and hopefully, uh, we'll be able to put them on, try them on, show people how motion capture works if you're on a budget. And uh, the goal with this presentation isn't just to say, hey, here's how motion capture works. It's also very much about um, how to do it with anthro characters. Uh, digitigrade legs need a lot of cleanup. Uh, there's a lot of self-clipping and, you know, uh, characters that are very short or very tall have to map to the people that they're mapped to. We'll go through it. I don't need to spend too much time on this slide. So uh, I'm gonna give a brief introduction of who I am and a, a little more in depth so you know who's talking to you and why. Um, I have a set of project goals, so things that my collective is working on that kind of inform the unique problem domain that we were trying to solve. Uh, unlike a lot of projects, we're a real-time film project. Uh, consider it as a 
uh, a live puppet show. We consider it digital puppetry more than we consider it as filmmaking or anything else. You might also call it machinima, right? Live machinima. Um, so, wow, that's weird. Uh, yeah, so we're going to go over what motion capture is and how that fits into the DCC uh, pipeline. Uh, we're going to talk about how we do a facial AR kit. That's the Apple face unlock. Uh, how we use that with muzzles. We've done a little bit of work thinking about blend shapes in that space. And I'm also going to explain what all of this means to everyone that raised their hand the second time. Uh, we're going to talk about retargeting digitigrade characters and kind of some of the struggles we've had with that. Uh, what that means is that we're going to uh, talk about uh, the retargeting process. We'll go into exactly what that is. Uh, and then I want to highlight my team and the people I've been working with, say thank you to them. They couldn't uh, all be here today because all of them are in the United States. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about a little bit what we've learned as a team. Um, for the lab, I have uh, t-shirts and some fun um, ways that we're going to select who gets to do it first. Um, from there, I'm going to introduce kind of Rococo Studio and set it up. Uh, all of these steps that I'm going to list now are things that we'll do along the way. They're not like modules or segments or anything like that. This is all going to be very freeform. But um, if we're like, crap, what do we do now? We've kind of figured this part out. We have some kind of a schedule to go back to if we want to figure out what we're doing. All right. This is the fun part of the boring part, depending on <laughs> how, you, uh, how, you, how you phrase this. Um, so you know who I am, or at least what to call me. Um, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into how our project got from me uh, to us and try to explain a little bit about who and why uh, we are who we are and how we came to be. So you might have seen this little logo in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, the name of our queer art collective is Lycanthrope. That's like lycanthropy, but with a camera. Uh, the original idea of the story here was we were going to do kind of a cam site but for werewolves. So uh, we're a queer art co-op. One of the things that we're really proud of and really strongly uh, emphatic about is that we're celebrating our queerness, our sexuality, and the community that we're a part of. Uh, for those that are wondering, no, this is not an NSFW panel. All of our characters have been spayed and neutered. Um, the uh, idea here, though, is that we're trying to keep, we're trying to make furry art keep furry weird, uh, and build a community of artists and friends that are making art together. And we hope to make some of those friends today as we look for additional collaborators. Um, so our titular first project, the Lycanthrope Project, the idea was that it was a TV show tuned into the mirror world of furries. So uh, this, this is, I'm going to read off the slide a little bit here. Uh, so it's a live 3D motion captured improv comedy puppet show for adults in the fandom. Uh, viewers can tune in for free uh, on our website and chat with our community on Telegram. Uh, what it isn't, though, is uh, for kids, right? We're more Fritz the Cat than Mickey Mouse. Um, the funny thing here is that this is literally the language we use with our bank. <laughs> so in order to get credit card processing and not say that we're a webcam site for werewolves, we need to talk a little bit more about the nature of the art. Uh, so when I was on the phone getting my credit card processing approved, um, we said, oh yeah, we're like a digital drag show. And the person on the other end was like, that's really cool. I like that. So without having to explain furry too much, uh, we're, you know, we, we just think of it as like rated R, right? It's not a sex thing. It's an adult thing, right? We, there might be drugs, alcohol, party, whatever, not for kids. Though I don't see too many of those in here. All right. Um, so my journey to 3D coincided with my adolescent journey into the fur furry fandom. Uh, like my journey into furry via LimeWire, like most uh, millennials, uh, my journey into 3D was pretty weird too. Uh, everyone in my family was a Mac user. So we had Power Macs and old CRT monitors and fax machines, and all my family was in creative. And, uh, you know, I didn't have PCs growing up. All my friends had PCs. They were able to play games. It was fun. It was cool. But I couldn't play with them. And what I did was I said to my mom, hey, you've got all this crap in the garage, modems and old stuff from your office. Can I sell that on eBay? And she says to me, what's eBay? 
so after I convinced her that selling her stuff in a virtual garage sale was the way to do it, I created a PayPal balance, bought myself an Athlon, not 64, not Ryzen, Athlon uh, computer. I bought uh, all the pieces and parts, put them together, uh, built a PC and went to my mom to say, hey, I need 100 bucks for Windows. Can I have Windows? And she's like, 100 bucks? No. So I said, all right, on my 56K modem, I've got uh, the ability to download the smallest Linux distribution I can find. Don't really know what Linux is yet. Let's try to get a free operating system. Got my 60 megabytes of Gentoo Linux, learned how to compile a kernel. Three months later, I still didn't have a computer. I only had an ex-Windows screen with uh, the mouse moving around. Uh, so I lost my whole summer to learning Linux. Uh, years later, um, uh, this foolish little kid uh, was able to get wine emulating Linux games or Windows ga games and uh, yeah, cute little kid, but uh, he learned a lot of Unix that summer. So uh, in those of you in the TikTok generation, yes, that is a fax machine. That's what they looked like. Um, but as much as I was interested in um, getting to games, this is the only thing that would run on that cool graphics card that I bought on Linux, Blender 2.3.4. And uh, it was a pretty early version, but at the time there were books out there like Bounce, Tumble, and Splash. There were books like uh, How to Start Rigging and Learning Blender. And as I uh, started learning this, uh, I realized that, you know, there's some art that I can do. I've never been that great of a 2D artist, but I always had a good sense of space and uh, really started learning it. 20 years later, um, I've been working in software for a very long time. and. Uh, that's how I got back into 3D. I'll give you a very quick explanation of kind of what happened there, uh, kind of coming back to the suspiciously wealthy furry thing. So after spending a decade in software engineering, I wasn't really being challenged at work. I had uh, big britches that I wanted to fill. Uh, and hashtag American idiot here decided to quit his job with very little money in the bank, start a business. And uh, I said to myself, hey, if I just make it, I can get out of this terrible relationship I'm in. I can be happy if I have all the money in the world. I can work on furry art and I can do whatever I want. Uh, that's going to be wonderful. That's going to be great. Uh, instead, I worked an average of about 100 hours a week in my garage smoking hookah. Uh, I gained about 100 pounds, of which I'm still trying to lose the weight. Um, and in 2017, I made $10,000 all year and had my house uh, go into foreclosure. I had my uh, that car repossessed in front of me. <laughs> uh, it was a really strange year. And uh, so after that, uh, I, was, I was just in a rough place. Uh, I came in to wanting to come back to art and stability and balance and uh, a, a good world. And uh, I realized that art was the thing to do. I was going through all my documents through a divorce, and I found all these lovely papers of art that I had done in the past. And I said to myself, all right, I've got all these random skills. I want to make a difference in the furry fandom. I really want to collaborate with people and do art. How can I contribute? And I realized that most of the intersections in my life, oh, here we go, Wi-Fi time. This is going to be tremendous. Um, make sure we let these load. Um, but yeah, the idea here is that I started skilling back up Maya, ZBrush, Unreal Engine, Houdini, things like that. So that's me in a large walnut shell. Um, let's start talking about the project and kind of what we did. Uh, I don't see any fursuit heads in here, in here, which is a strange thing for EF. Normally there's at least one suitor suffering through the heat. Um, but if they were in suit, I would ask them to wiggle their eyebrows. This is my friend Faron, and uh, he has a permanent come hither look. Uh, but I guess my point here is that you cannot wiggle your eyebrows if you are in fursuit. Facial dynamics is a big part of the. <gasps> Can you wiggle your eyebrows? No. Okay. Yeah. So that's this. <laughs> The exterior of your fursuit does not move with your face. It's unfortunate. Um, and it's especially unfortunate because there's a lot of facial expressions that are wonderful, right? Um, my husband, uh, Nick here, is a great example of you know, the great emotional range 
that a muzzle and big googly eyes uh, can give you, but um, unfortunately my punchline is still loading. Man, I really should have downloaded the offline version of this, huh? But unfortunately, my speaker notes are on my phone. It only works on the online version. We'll give this just a few seconds. Oh, come on. Well, you get the idea. All right, so our first goal was to fulfill the furry fantasy. We really wanted to work our way backwards from a set of goals. And that second goal, please just load. Yeah, there is an element missing. I do have an offline version of this presentation, and I'm just very briefly going to switch to it. It might not have all of the all the best things. 821. That's not too long ago. All right. Uh, Neritas, you previously offered to come press slides for me. Thank you. And I realize that I can use my speaker notes on my phone and just have both presentations going, so maybe that's not so bad. Um, we're on slide 22. Yeah, you can just use the, the left, no, right here. I think you should just be able to press right arrow. Cool. Wow, uh, let's do a few more. Four, keep going. Yep, 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 yep. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, okay, punchline, there we go. Uh, 21 and 22. Excellent. So um, there might, you might notice there's an element missing here. Anyone want to shout out what this lovely animation is missing? Uh, yeah, audio. We do have audio for everything else, too. So when we do have videos, with it's a GIF. So it's kind of missing the audio. Uh, it's missing something in particular. Keep uh, Next slide. It's missing a hug and a kiss. Right? All the time, we're baited in furry media. We go watch a movie or start uh, figuring out a, uh, a, new enterprise, a new franchise or something because we're baited with the werewolf boyfriend or the hot female character. And they're just this violent, raging, blood-filled you know, action. And uh, that's good sometimes, but I want a more whole, complete experience. Next slide, thank you. So the next thing I want is culture, right? RuPaul's Werewolf Drag Race would be pretty cool. Um, I want the Werewolf Bachelorette. I want RuPaul's Monster Fucker. I want something. Give me something to chew on here. Uh, next slide. Um, wait a second. Is mine working? When I do next slide, does it do it? No, I'm a fool. It's all right. We're on slide 24. Back to 24, please. No, it's all right. We can, st we can go here. Yeah. All right, and then, and then 25. So yeah, the goal is to make the media we want to see. So next slide. All right, uh, final set of goals. We want to build a community. There's a lot of individual contributors in the fandom. A lot of people that are working solo, a lot of people that want to contribute to a larger project that can't because there's not a central place to do that. We're trying to create a platform and a community to share that. Uh, next. Uh, we want to work with and celebrate our friends and colleagues next and uh, produce a living legacy for the next generation through queer fringe DIY art. We want to keep furry weird and, uh, you know, pre prevent it from being gentrified by Disney. Uh, next slide, please. So fulfill the fantasy, make the media we want to see, build a community. That's what we're trying to do. Next. Uh, so how do we accomplish this? We worked our way backwards. We didn't start programming, writing, drawing, or doing anything until we had our goals in mind. Uh, next. We started with a VR dating sim. Uh, that was a undertaking that was never going to be completed with the staff and experience and skills we had. We really wanted to do uh, love and adventure and drama and blah and never going to happen. So next slide. Uh, the next thing we said is, all right, we have um, more skill with this animation stuff. We're able to do it in real time. Uh, let's do the stripper G-string thing. Let's just, you know, come to our campsite, give us a dollar, and we'll do whatever you want. We'll say whatever you want. ASMR is a big thing. People are sitting in hot tubs having their ears licked. Who knows? Maybe we can uh, work our way through med school with this stripper thing and try to get off the ground that way. Uh, next slide. 
eventually we said, you know, uh, we really don't want to go all in. We don't want to be another, just another adult site. Um, and we wanted to be funny as a primary trait and sexy as a secondary trait. So we were starting to do some burlesque stuff, dancing, singing, a little more uh, like that. Um, and a lot of it seemed to click. You know, it was a sexy, funny adult variety show. So uh, that was born from that. Next slide. Uh, ultimately, though, we realized that it was very hard to play leapfrog and do cartwheels and uh, even high-five each other with this solution, with the Rococo solution. And we realized that we needed to put people on individual podiums where they could not physically interact, but we could cut cameras and things like this. And we ended up with our E621 game show. So I'll go into all of these things, but the reason it's important to know the iterations is that it's how the project evolved from a technical perspective. So this talk is about technical, the tech art part of the whole solution. Um, and knowing this progression that we started with something very wide, boiling the ocean and moved to something very specific should help you understand the technical choices we made along the way. Uh, next slide. Also, does anyone know if there's water anywhere in this room? Don't see any. That's all right. Get ready for. All right. So our unique problem domain. Here's the problems we were trying to solve. We're on slide 32. So that, that's a summary of the history of where we were and where we're coming from. And uh, let's go to the specific technical details now. Let's go to 33. All right. Uh, I'll keep this part very short as well. Uh, there's a lot of unique problems in the furry fandom for a lot of different projects, and one of them is monetization. Uh, if you think about Natalie Wynn, ContraPoints, she recently did a video on uh, heroin, but she couldn't say it. She couldn't say drugs. She couldn't talk about the ad real adult possibilities of addiction and pr real problems. She had to use this extended metaphor. And while that's art through adversity, and what she did was wonderful, wouldn't have been a lot easier if YouTube wouldn't demonetize her for talking about the pro thing that she's trying to talk about. So that pervasive sense of censorship on YouTube is difficult. So um, let's go to the next one. Um, YouTube demonetizes those channels. Uh, so we wanted to create a sustainable co-op that allows everyone to get paid. We can't get paid. No one else can either. Um, let's go to the next, around 35. Yeah. So then we wanted to go to the control of distribution over content. Uh, next slide. I really want to get banned in Russia, is what I'm saying, right? So if I have the ability to create uh, content that makes Putin mad and my website gets banned in Russia versus just delisted on YouTube, it looks a lot cooler. Uh, 36. Uh, we also wanted to take tips. We wanted to be able to take, uh, take money and say, hey, you control the action, tell us what to do kind of uh, uh, a little difficult to do on YouTube. It's hard to get those in, uh, specific dollars on YouTube through that, uh, uh, that way. Uh, next slide. But I don't think anyone really cares about that anymore. Again, there's a lot of people in hot tubs uh, taking money on Twitch, uh, which is for kids. So I don't think anyone cares anymore, but um, just in case, we wanted to control our monetization. Next slide. Uh, so we solved those problems by creating our own sub three second latency streaming service, uh, creating our own commerce and community. Uh, and then the thing we're talking about today, yes, I know we're half an hour into this presentation, live motion capture. So we wanted to do it all live. So we uh, invested in that. Let's go to our next slide. Hopefully this plays automatically. It should, yes. All right, this, sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. So I'll let you guys watch this video real quick. This is our first iteration of uh, motion capture using the HTC Vive system. This was using Ikinema Orion. <sighs> Inshallah, clean mouth. All right. So this was using NVIDIA Hairworks on Unreal Engine 4.18. Um, we had a pretty derpy little character. Uh, but we had fun with it. It was our first full time going end to end with a character to motion capture. The fur moved, he could wiggle his little butt, and he could dance around and move. Um, as you can see, there's the Steam VR window that has the headset and all the trackers and the, uh, the Vive pucks. 
and uh, it's got a little nub butt. I think he's going to wiggle it in a second here. Nope. Yeah. But uh, the idea here is that, as you notice, we have the same VR problems that everyone else does, right? There's his broken elbow, uh, his out of place socket. Uh, I think he turns into a goo ball here in a second. Um, and if you also notice, his paws are just frozen in space, right? So there's a lot of things that have come a long way with the VR part, including the, uh, the knuckles from Vive. You have some more finger motion now. There's the goo ball. Um, but yeah, um, VR has a lot of limitations. That looks horrible. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> All right, so Ikinema then bought, uh, Apple then bought Ikinema. So I had spent hundreds of dollars on all these different pieces of hardware and software. And then Apple uh, bought the company, took the software page online, canceled all licenses, and, and literally took the website down overnight. The software stopped working overnight. So I was like, all right, I'm so invested in doing this. This is my hobby. I don't eat, I don't sleep, I do this uh, in addition to working. So this was uh, pretty bad. I, I was really upset. Let's go to the next one. Uh, and then I was so upset uh, that I bought the Rococo system in December. Uh, so like the Tiger King, I have yet to financially recover from this. Uh, next slide. But when we got it shipped to us in December, this is a little difficult to see. Um, and I also forgot to edit this video <laughs> so that it uh, actually had something going. Um, we actually might come back to it in a second. Um, I'll just tell the story for now, and when it's ready, I'll point to it. Yeah, a lot of me telling the guy, oh yeah, go do the thing. So the person you're seeing here is my friend Rune. Uh, he's the person who our character in the background is based on, a uh, little tiger guy. But Rune uh, and I, I was basically living in his basement, working on this constantly. Um, and we, I took over his basement. I, I was like encroaching upon his Christmas tree, in fact. And uh, come on, go to the go to the part. <laughs> there we go. So we had just set it up, uh, and we started getting this character mapped. That character might look a little familiar. That is Tyrno, Tyrno's werewolf from his Patreon. We talked to him a long while ago and said, "Hey, can we like practice with your characters? Can we like try some rigging and try some of this? Because I'm not that great at modeling. I'd really like to just work on our tech art pipeline." And uh, this was the first go of this. We had a front-facing motion capture for the face on the phone. He was flapping his jaw and moving around and using the Vive to uh, track his position in space. All right, let's go to the next slide. So at that time, we didn't want to be another adult site. We didn't want to, you know, let's actually scoot through this a little quickly. I don't want to spend too much here. Let's go to the end of it. Uh, I, th I think that's it. So long story short, we get one character up, we see that we can do whatever the hell we want with it, and we say, holy crap, we can sing and dance and take requests, right? That's a big thing for uh, interactivity online. We can get some tips, we can work on that. Uh, but furries a big tent. What if we celebrated every single thing that furries do, music, art, dance, sexy stuff, and uh, invite on special guests, whatever. What if it was a late show? Could be fun. Next slide, please. I don't know. I think it's coming. Any moment. Uh, all right. So we came up with uh, kind of different TV shows and personas and these things. I want to get to some other stuff. So let's keep going. We'll skip over some of this because I want to. All right. This is the fun part. So the project, we'll get back to it. We'll answer some stuff during Q&A. I want to go to what is motion capture. This is why you're all here. So um, motion capture is the place where you get the primary motion for animation. So in uh, filmmaking, sequential art, right? you get one frame, you get another frame, it turns into 24 frames, which turns into a few seconds. Uh, you have the primary motion. So the primary, uh, no, keep, go back. Um, so animators are gonna take this primary motion and do the tweaks and do the cleanup. And uh, on the left, you actually see the Panini video from Little Nos X. He filmed Panini with the Rococo suits. Um, you'll notice in the video that the motion, and not just this clip, but he's only one actor, right? Uh, the robots behind him are doing a lot of, uh, it's a digital double, and they're doing uh, backup dancing for him. But he recorded all the moves, is what I understand. Um, 
if uh, we'll, we'll go into depth with it, but know that um, it's the primary motion and then it's cleaned up. It's the, what comes out of motion capture is never the final product. Uh, next slide. So um, this one is pretty interesting. That's Lady Demiscu or whatever it is from uh, Resident Evil 8. And the motion actor here is doing uh, real time and interactive motion capture here. This is for a cinematic, but the thing to note here is that there are additional interactions, right? There may be a physics engine driving the motion of a hat. There may be, um, the table might have careened off to the side, but there might be additional physics keeping it in the room. Things like this. What you're also seeing here is optical motion capture and virtual production. So let's go to the next slide. Virtual production is how they did The Lion King. It's one of the big things that, um, uh, it's one of the big things that, and these are my old slides, by the way, so some of these are gonna be a little blank. <laughs> I just wanted to keep it moving here, so forgive some of the uh, missing text. But, so The Lion King was filmed as a video game, right? People had uh, basically HTC Vives and optical motion capture and were just moving cameras around in an empty space. Uh, and for that, they were getting a digital representation with filmmakers' tools uh, to film in a virtual space. So this is kind of similar to what we're doing. It's the world's most expensive machinima. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go to the next. Uh, so then the other part of virtual production is in-camera VFX. The Mandalorian is a big user of this kind of thing. Uh, they have a LED wall that f goes to the top of the room, the side of the room, the sides of the room, the back of the room, and that allows light to project off of something like a motorcycle so that you don't have to do in post-production, uh, you don't have to you know, edit in the reflections from camera tracking and things like this. You can just roll a motorcycle into the room, change the virtual background, get the lighting you want, and take the shot. So Mandalorian used a lot of that. People are using it in commercials. As you notice, the light is changing. That's not a filter. That's literally what the camera sees. There's no change. So they just have big LED walls doing that. That's also with Unreal Engine virtual production. Uh, next slide. So let's go very quickly through the digital content creation pipeline for characters. Uh, there was a lovely presentation yesterday uh, by another one of our EF attendees. Wanna, wanna say hi? <laughs> She's right there. If you saw her, she was wonderful. It was a very good presentation. And uh, so I'm not gonna cover too much here. Uh, we're gonna go through it really quick because I know we're low on time. We wanna get to the labs. Uh, but it is, yeah, go ahead. So this is the character art for my friend Rune. Go ahead. Uh, as you can see, there's a ref sheet as well. So there's a high detail rendering, and then there's a ref sheet with all the different patterns, markings, importances, and you're all furries. Most of you have a ref sheet in here. You know what it's all about. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so from that uh, ref sheet, I started doing some sculpting. There's a lot of different ways to do sculpting that were covered yesterday, so I'm not gonna go too far into it. Uh, there's some good mobile tools for this that weren't covered. So Nomad and Forger are both iPad tools, which are pretty fun. And then, of course, Blender for everything. Let's go to the next. There's a little turntable of the character that we're going to be working with today. He's got a mega cake, um, biggest cake, little foot paws, a lot, of good a lot of good things. He's got the beans. He's got the cake. He's the whole kitchen. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so retopology. Right, so after we're done uh, building a high-res model, we're going to make it lower uh, resolution so that it works in real time and it works quickly in film and rendering. Uh, there's, of course, a ton of paid tools for these. One you may not have heard of is Exocide Quad Remesher, the person that made the ZBrush uh, Z Remesher tool left ZBrush and made this. It's a standalone tool that works with ZBrush and other tools. It's 60 bucks and it works pretty well. There's also open source tools that do the same thing. Uh, you can also manually remesh something, especially when it's a primary character. It might make a lot of sense to do that. Uh, in other words, there's more than one way to skin a cat. You get some UVs, you make a rug, and uh, at the end of the day, that allows you to put a two-dimensional texture onto a 3D object in space. Uh, we'll go through that as well. Let's go next. That's the high res of his lovely abdominals. Next. 
and that's what it looks like uh, when I did a little retopology. You'll notice the belly button and a lot of details are gone, but that's because the character uses real-time fur. We have a groom that goes on top of it that's rendered in real time in Unreal Engine. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is Houdini, where I'm doing my rigging. Uh, you can see here the process of taking uh, joints, which are the balls, little dots. The balls uh, and little dots are connected in a hierarchy known as a skeleton. That skeleton can uh, be bound to skin. So you see here the infrared view from blue, which means no weight, to red or white, which means 100% to like 99%. Um, and you can, with those weights, determine when one joint moves or rotates or scales, uh, how it affects the po individual points that are connected to those joints. So I'm in my T pose and I start to move. That's because the joints have moved and rotated. If you have a cartoon character instead of a realistic character, you might see some squash and stretch that does not involve joints rotating. But as you notice, uh, your bones only extend so far, right? So you can't move your toe past a certain point without rotating your joints. Uh, next. Next again. Yeah. So let's go to the face. This is something we talked a little bit about. In my very first attempts to do this with a toilet paper roll, it looks like, and a uh, screwdriver and a coat hanger, um, I got a uh, Sony action cam connected to a wireless HDMI, uh, which connected to a video input. I did real-time processing on the face using, I think it was called face capture or something, iClone, I think it was using uh, faceware. Facebook was the product. And uh, it mapped my eyebrows, eyes, nose, mouth, sent that data to so Unreal Engine, and that's where I got some of my first facial motion capture experience. Uh, that's a little untenable. Next. <laughs> Event, uh-oh. We'll find out. Uh, there's a wireless HDMI here. There we go. So here we have another one of Tyranno's characters that we did blend shapes for in the face. Uh, we'll go through what blend shapes are, but uh, here you can see me lip syncing poorly, I think to the talking heads, I don't remember. But the idea here is that there, on the top right is the iPhone that I'm using. I have it in front of my face. It's capturing the 52 blend shapes from ARKit, transmitting them over the open sound control protocol, OSC. And in the lower right is a touch OSC control panel that I created to monitor the individual blend shapes. So from here to here is each blend shape from 0 to 100%. And I have controls at the top for muting some or reducing their multipliers so that they have uh, less impact. If I do smiling and it looks like a snarl because I've triggered 10 different blend shapes, it's nice to be able to turn those down and save them for individual actors. Having a beard, having a different facial structure, things like this will make the system behave a little differently each time. So we want to be able to tune that as we're doing live performance. Uh, next, please. So uh, I made a series of these blend shape tutorial images that allow us to, as we're sculpting these blend shapes, isolate which parts of the blend shape are important to the data. So if I have blend shapes that overlap, right? So if when I wink, um, I'm moving down here, uh, or when I smile, uh, it moves something up here, I might get a little indentation or some kind of artifact if there's too much overlap between those blend shapes. And Apple did a really good job of isolating where each of these goes. So I used uh, one of my anatomy and physiology books to paint on the face, uh, the isolate the muscle groups. And then I used a uh, procedural uh, Houdini stuff to isolate what was actually moving with a, with a mask. Uh, I can show you guys that during the lab if you're interested. Uh, next slide, please. So what I did is I took the AR kit blend shape and I put it on the character. Next. And uh, I then did a Go Z export to ZBrush. I mushed it onto the face so that each point was able to correlate with the right spot on the character. So then procedurally, I'd be able to say, hey, uh, next, next slide. Uh, procedurally, I'd be able to uh, go through and, and map big motions to the right places on the blend shape automatically. 
So you can see here, the, there's blend shapes that are very involved and involve a lot of the face. We'll go to the next. So uh, that's what the GoZ export looked like on the left and on the right. That's an example of the data that I had to work with. So the white area is what I'm supposed to move on the left mask. Next. So then I mapped, I, I projected the part that I should move onto the part that I wanted to move. You can see there. Next. Uh, and ultimately, the workflow looked like this. I would have a, uh, a mask that automatically was mapped as a starter point for each of the 52 shapes. So from there, I would export all those OBJs, combine them, and I'd have a, a pipeline where I could just go through each individual file, clean it up and move it. I didn't have to worry too much about getting it right each time. So a more rapid character creation pipeline for what we were trying to do. Uh, next. This is where we are today. I'm going to let you guys watch this for a bit. You really have to overact with some of these shapes. <laughs> this video is about uh, two minutes long. I hate his teeth. <laughs> We're still working on some of these. Try to get a few different views, but I'm going to point out some things here. Homie's got a big smile, right? He's got a muzzle. The problem with muzzles is that human beings do not have them. And when you think about shapes that your mouth makes, after you, right? You really have to push from the back of the muzzle to the front of the muzzle, and it creates a little bit of an unnatural shape. I think this is the reason why a lot of Disney characters are super short muzzles, right? You don't see people with super long ones. So I wanted to get a little snarl look here. God, I hate his teeth. <laughs> Kit bash. Notice the blinks as well. They're not ideal, right? One of the things that the OS, I'm going to actually wait, because it's probably hard to understand two English voices at once. So one moment. All right, I think that's it. Let's go to the next. Uh, yeah, this is fine. Right here is fine. So as a recap of what we just saw, one of the hard things to do in furry mocap and furry animation is get it right from a lovability perspective. You don't want these things to look wrong. Um, I think a lot of the reasons that you see in mainstream media characters that are is because it's hard to make them go ooh, <laughs> right? If you're, if you're big muzzle, it's for something, right? Uh, when you have uh, a smile, when you have... Um, dogs don't really smile, right? They kind of... <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. Fur and grooming. What you're seeing in the square is fur and grooming. You've been seeing this the whole time, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. This is a real-time rendering. Uh, well, wow. <laughs> uh, it's in-engine. So this is in Unreal Engine 5. Uh, this is using their high-quality cinema renderer. Each frame takes about one second uh, to run. And uh, yeah, there's, I think, three lights in this scene, so it rendered fairly quickly. Uh, but I think it looks pretty nice for near real time. Let's go next. This is the SOP, the SOP network in Houdini that created some of this. We try to do everything procedurally. There's a lot of talk about non-destructive workflows, and if you've ever worked in Maya XGen or uh, other grooming and fur tools, shave and a haircut back when that was a thing, um, you may notice crashes <laughs> with, your, uh, with your work, and when it crashes, you tend to lose and corrupt and lose a lot of stuff. SOP networks are very interesting. I can go back, this is my output, I can trace it all the way back to the very first thing that I did, and I can step through 
each individual step of the grooming process. So I might see, I don't know how much I actually detailed with this, but um, the fur might just start out straight, little pokey bits, just straight pointing out like a cactus. And uh, from there, you can groom it. You can push it backwards. You can poof it out. You can curl it. And each one of those steps is represented in this network. Uh, we'll be going through Houdini live in the lab. So if you've never seen it, it'll be cool to check it out. So next, please. All right. Um, this is a brief time lapse of a video stream I did a long time ago. This is about five hours of troubleshooting the stupidest issue I have ever troubleshot in 3D. Notice the red to green, that's a UV map of the fur. This is me Googling the problem over and over and over and over. Uh, you can, the reason I show this video is <laughs> you can see some of the individual steps with the fur. Um, I'm bringing it from Unreal 4 to Unreal 5. There's a change in Unreal 5 where it caps the number of individual follicles grooming system to about 300,000. After it goes to 300,000, it resets the UV counter. And all of a sudden, you have these weird spiraling patterns that look like it's part of your texture. Maybe your UV map is wrong. What's going on? Why doesn't it work? So I was comparing uh, a simple export. This is the simplest for grooming. You see how it's just this flat ball. We're giving it different properties and values like a clump ID. Uh, and then I'm, I, I continue to troubleshoot and test this. You can see me getting a little exasperated at some points. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, I figure it out, and uh, that's that. That was hours of work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so clothing and accessories. Uh, yesterday, we talked a little bit about a Marvelous Designer, where you can cut sewing patterns and simulate them onto character. Um, and I think that it is a lot of fun. It's probably the most fun we've had during the project, is designing what does it look like when you put pants on a digi character? I don't know. It's fun. Cut a little tail hole in the pants. It's cool. I like it a lot. So these are, these are some of them. Uh, as you can see, uh, the character on the left, Rune, is wearing the shirt that I'm wearing. It was a lot of fun to do. Uh, let's go to the next. So you can see a little bit of Marvelous Designer here. Uh, in this video, I'm uh, showing the, uh, a, a simulated pattern on the left. And then, as you can see, there's little lines. And when you simulate it, it glues them all together. So you can, uh, you can kind of see what's going on there. Then you can adjust it, you can pin it, you can stretch it, you can drape it, um, and all that. I have two of these white shirts to give away. So uh, as a thank you for listening to this long presentation. Uh, all right, so that's Marvelous Designer, clothing and accessories. At this stage, next please. Uh, at this stage, we have a full character pipeline. You've seen kind of what's going into some of the characters that we're going to work with. This is a lot of text on the slide. It's indicative of how much stuff's going on here. All right, so uh, the short end of this, there's two kinds of motion capture, optical and inertial. Today, we're going to be working with inertial mocap. Uh, what we would love, I think what anyone would love to have is a full-on Vicon or Shogun or Optitrack system in their own home. Wouldn't that be cool? It's like having a swimming pool in your basement, a Maserati. Um, but no one can have that. Um, what, we're, what we're showing here, I, I say that because uh, we actually talked to Vicon and we talked to Optitrack and we got quotes for our office space to get it. And uh, we're surprised. We're, we were surprised with that uh, because that was only about 80 grand US, $80,000. So never going to happen. Um, but with, uh, with Vicon off the table, you can do HTC Vive, right? So in VR chat, you can uh, put on the Vive trackers and do full body capture. You can do your hands, your fingers, all of those things. Uh, back in the day, Microsoft Connect, right? Connectimals. Who played Connectimals? Yeah, I did too. We're three in the room. So Connectimals was cool because you put the little IR motion tracker in front of you, and you got to play with kitties and doggies, and you got to kick the ball to them. They'd catch it because it, what it would do is it would track a very rudimentary skeleton so you could play volleyball, and you'd hit it in the right place, and it would track you. Thank you so, so much. Oh. 
Oh, goodness. So Connect is cool. Anyone with an iPhone can look directly at their iPhone and see a Connect because the uh, IR camera and the visual camera, Apple bought the technology from Microsoft and made it very small and made it fit in your iPhone. Um, so if you're familiar with the OpenNI project and you have an old Connect, you can do facial motion capture, you can track your hands, you can track a point cloud, all very cool stuff. A good reason to find an old Connect. What all these have in common is they have an infrared transmitter that is picking up on infrared reflective points and those infrared cameras read the position of the dots and uh, algorithmically uh, they're going to build a skeleton and they're going to solve for it. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. All right. So um, this next kind of motion capture is inertial motion capture. And you see there's a compass in the lower left-hand corner. That compass represents the magnetic nature of the sensors in the Rococo suits and the Xsense Maven suits. Uh, in any inertial motion capture system, there's two senses of input. Uh, it has a magnetic um, component that's a compass, north, south, east, west, and a uh, gyroscope. And that's how you get the quaternion that allows you to move each of these points in space. Um, there are three that I know of, Rococo, X-Sense, and Perception Neuron. Uh, all of them represent a happy, inexpensive medium between the low-end optical motion capture and the high-end optical motion capture. Um, it may not be as good as Vicon by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a tenth of the cost. So I have four of those suits and gloves uh, and iPhones, and that was only about $11,000 versus the 80000 90000 from a Vicon system to track the same amount of people. So uh, not a bad gig. Um, at the end of the day, it's going to use an algorithm to interpret the signals over Wi-Fi, it's all active sensors, uh, and capture a skeleton. That's what we're doing today at the end of the lecture. Uh, next. Nice. A little buggy. So let's retarget some digi characters for mocap. Next, please. All right. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, all right, we've got our rig. We've got our skin. Everything is attached. Let's do a quick ROM, a range of motion test. Mine look usually the same. I just make sure every little bit moves, and then I skip the fingers because I'm lazy. So uh, after I've got a basic idea that everything works, next slide, I'm going to connect it to my engine and start moving around. So this is me doing my first motion capture test with Rune. Um, I'm uh, just trying different little things and watching. All of this is in real time. So I'm in front of my computer monitor watching this happen. Uh, this is not the standard workflow for motion capture. This is specific to our problem domain. Um, we, as improv actors, I think I failed to mention this, one of the uh, inspirations for this project is that my team had been doing, yeah, cake, beautiful, oh, love cake. The um, inspirations for this, we were all in an improv group. We had been performing at furry conventions, and doing game shows and improv and all that. So we wanted a way to do it in fursuit, but of course we couldn't wiggle our eyebrows, we couldn't emote facially, so this was one of the solutions to that. So, uh, yeah, uh, quick, quick test. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the bulk, maybe not time-wise, but the bulk of the effort that I've put into this. Um, this is the 10 lessons learned, motion capture-wise, from the anthro perspective. So I am going to pull up my notes for this, hopefully. Let's see here. We are on slide 79. Not as nice. Okay. Yeah, here we go. 78, 78, 79. All right. No, no. What happened? Didn't you didn't do it. Go back and go forward. Uh-oh. Refresh? You don't like it. Is it like crashing? Okay. Okay. One more forward. Give it a second, I guess. I guess it's having a hard day. It's having a day. Oh, you know what it might be? It's the, is it working on the, well, there's really no way to tell. Let's give it a refresh. I don't know. Let's find out. Together. 
Yeah, no, it's the it's the it's not the computer. It's the this oh, like thingy. Is this no. Oh, it is. Okay, here we go. This is going all right, all right. One more. Hey. All right. So, um, challenges. Where we start running the issue is sitting with digi legs. As you can see here, it looks okay with a plantigrade character. It looks like he's sitting. Next slide. However, with our digi character, and I know he's not that digi, but he's got the chicken bone legs. Um, when he takes a sit, uh-oh, that looks a little weird. Part of this is that the knees are just in different places, right? We have a nice uh, Z shape here. Here, as you can see, it goes up and back and down. And this is where, uh, and we can do this live as well. Um, when someone sits in a digi scenario, what you're supposed to do is just kick it forward, move it out, right? Do an adjustment. But the way that we retargeted it, it just didn't look that good. Some solutions to this could include um, either manually going back and editing some of the points. You can also um, create IK solvers that are aware of the issue. So when you sit at a certain point, it's going to trigger, hey, I'm at 45 degrees on left leg. I'm going to trigger some uh, procedural step to limit the rotation or to add to rotation or to solve to a particular target. Maybe you have a point floating outside of the knee that says, hey, we want to target over here and move it there. Um, but as has been said previously, you can work on something forever and never be done. So you have to find a point in which you stop. Uh, this is where we stopped. We said, we're going to avoid digi characters. <laughs> oh, no, but what we could avoid is certain poses. All right, next slide, please. Is it stuck? Uh, p move the mouse over to the screen. I think the screen's to the right. Let's make sure we have focus on the screen. There we go, 81. All right, so the character's going to get up, and it's going to move to the side. Notice he has stanky leg. So stanky leg, and you will notice this as we do this, is when you... Uh, the trackers on the feet tend to slide hugely. If you don't wrap them up uh, with, with, uh, with tape or an ace bandage or something, uh, they'll, they'll slide. So you see him bounce when his foot corrects. That's when we do what's called a straight pose. Um, in the Rococo suits, you're going to stand with your feet about uh, equal distance. You're going to just be calm and relaxed like he is. And then you'll see it pop, and then it'll be a little better. Um, yeah, so the stanky leg is something that we learned to solve for. So when he snaps back to the center, notice he's totally straight and normal and narrow. Um, these suits drift tremendously. Uh, so that's one of the things we learned is that we have to build into our performance the ability to find times to reset the characters uh, and to bind the feet, etc. cetera. Um, all right, next one. So the runaway train is not... Is that the same one? Ah, yeah, there we go. We're almost sequential. So Drew is now sitting and sitting and stretching and continuing to stretch and continuing to stretch. He's not moving, as you can see. Uh, the reason for this, yeah, it's, it just keeps on going. Um, the reason for the runaway leg is that um, Rococo has something called a, a locomotion solver. So when I move my big old Legos, um, it notices that the leg has lifted off the plane that is the ground and set down, and it's going to move the character forward. Uh, Rococo's solution to the runaway leg uh, and all those problems, oh, so bad. Yeah, don't sit for too long is the answer. Honestly, there's really nothing you can do about it. It's not my code. Um, what we've found is that you just don't sit for that long or that often. Uh, let's go back to digital puppetry. Please. Yeah, if, you, if, if, they, if they just constantly keep moving and solving for the, yeah. What we ended up doing, though, is uh, in addition to the motion capture actors, we have puppeteers. So if you remember the old werewolf costumes, people with the RC controllers moving the jaws, we have an iPad for each character with custom buttons. One of those buttons is a drift fix. 
We can push it to toggle it and they'll stay in place. We'll literally just update them every second to move to the center root of motion. Uh, and then if we don't do that, uh, we, can we can isolate parts of the body. So if we notice that there's an issue, we can play an animation, right? We just skip the live and we go back to a, we blend to a, a normal pose and we can do that isolated, different parts of the body. Uh, so there's all kinds of little fixes. We've had to come up with different stuff along the way. Uh, let's go to the next one. So IDing bad data. This one's tough, right? Because you may just be, so <laughs> it's, if you think, yes, please. Absolutely, and, and in Houdini, there's actually a, uh, there's a couple of different foot solvers that allow you to say, uh, hey, I'm about to step, lock it in place, fix the heel. Like there's a ton of really cool SOPs that do that. Uh, and with Houdini 19.5, we're in Python 3.9. And if you're a tech guy, you know that Python 3.9 is like 30% faster than the old Python. And uh, the reason we don't do it very often is because when we start stacking the solvers, we drop frame rate and our minimum frame rate is 24 frames. Uh, j with, with this setup, we were getting 60 frames a second and we could have higher. Um, one of the things you might be asking is, is, when do I get to play this cool game at home, right? Well, we, have to, we render all this on a 3090 RTX. And uh, that's out of reach for a lot of people, uh, not only because it's very expensive, but because go find one, right? They were gone for forever. And as a matter of fact, if ours dies, we're probably screwed. <laughs> we won't be able to find a new one. So um, let's, so IDing bad data. Um, what was I going to say here? Let's watch it for a second. Yeah, so there's three panels of output that we watch. We watch the video on a monitor in our control room. We watch the Rococo output, and we watch the Unreal output. The Unreal output is direct from Houdini. So we go from Rococo to Houdini to Unreal. So we don't need to watch the uh, Houdini part. We just need to watch the Unreal part. But notice that when he's, he's got mega stanky leg on the left, right? Like he's just collapsed. He's squatting, but the legs are all wrong. And excuse me, I'm using the incorrect pronouns. Uh, so what, what you'll notice is when uh, he on the right begins to, to squat and do that stance, it works. On the left, though, totally wrong, right? If you're not watching the um, right window, um, you might make a bad assumption. Hey, maybe I rigged it wrong. Maybe my skinning is really bad. Maybe the solvers that I have are screwing it up. But if you look at the Rococo window, the source data, source data was screwed. So even their non uh, digi character, their Newton T pose guy, uh, was messed up. So it's good to have, if you're doing live in real time, or even if you're just doing a recording session and watching the output, be sure to watch the Rococo stuff. Uh, watch your source data, because it can get screwed up. It might, you might start tracking with bad data. All right, next. All right. Um, so that's the fix. Notice that he's back to normal once, uh, once they have done the straight pose again. On the left, you can see that they, their horse pose looks totally fine, right? <laughs> We've got everyone uh, wiggling around here. And uh, you can see I did a very bad job skinning the pants. There's no issue there, right? Uh, but you also see him floating a little, so that's again, like you have, you have to keep moving your feet a little bit. All right, let's go to the next slide. That's with the good data. All right, uh, maybe one more. All right, extreme poses. Oh, actually do go back one. I realize there's a third one. So everyone's gonna touch their toes here. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I didn't do this one right. Yeah, I did it in the new slide. My bad. Next. Basically, what I was going to show you is that when they bend down to touch their toes, his arm goes off to the right. Uh, Rococo Studio Beta currently has a bug where it just doesn't work after a few hours. You have to create a new scene. So restarting the suits, redoing the Wi-Fi, doing all this stuff didn't matter. Um, I'll get back to that. Maybe we'll see the bug, we'll see the bug live. So extreme poses. Uh, with Digi, it's insanely pronounced. Uh, so he's just doing lunges, but 
as you see, like, <laughs> like there's just some things that, that really don't work. Digi doesn't do well with the extreme poses. Rokoko already kind of provides dubious data. So as we, get, uh, as we get better at the kin effect stuff internally, we think we can solve some of these problems. But yeah, there can just be trouble with these. So all right, let's do the next one. Uh-oh. Do I have no notes on that slide? Or is this thing just lagging? Yeah, no notes on this slide. All right, let's go to the next. Wait. Is this? Yeah, next. Sorry. Cool. So if it might even be a little hard to notice at this difference, but do you see what's going on with his leg? What he's doing, what they're doing is they're going from here around to the back. And when they do that, the leg goes straight through the other leg. This is a digi thing. Um, it's because uh, Rococo is tracking kind of a straight object and feeding that in. Uh, when, when they switch over, it's, uh, the bones never cross, right? The bones have never crossed here, but the legs do. You might say to yourself, Connor, why don't you just use Unreal Engine to create capsule physics and make sure that they don't block? The answer to this is either I am hundreds of hours of stupid, which is extremely possible. I could be very stupid and be missing something. But what I found was is that the 30 frames a second of animation data applied to collision means that it bounces, and then it bounces, and then it bounces, and then it's wacky, flailing, inflatable arm tube man. The, the, issue, the issue tends to be that um, with the collision, if you tell something to collide, against the wall, you have to solve for where that collision goes afterwards. So it could be ice skating, it could be jiggling, or it could be all kinds of stuff. We're still kind of playing with it, but it's been a lower priority for us as we've worked on just kind of cheating around it. Instead of trying to find the perfect solution for never clipping, one of the things we ended up doing was just create, I think I go over this in a second, so I'm not going to spoil it. All right, next. Uh, yeah, bespoke tailoring. This is this is the one. Uh, I think he. I think Drew on the right is going to do it next. Hold on, let's find out. Nope. All right, next. Is Drew doing it now? Yeah. So here's the plantigrade character doing it. It's a little better. Still a little bit of clip, but as you can see, it, uh, what? Uh, okay. Yeah. So it, it it looks all right. It looks a little better. Right. Doesn't go straight through the leg. All right. Next. He's going to do it the other direction now, around to the back. All right, very good. Next. All right, stop touching yourself. Oh, let's see what this one's about. I almost don't remember. I have such a good title for it. Oh, right. Um, so it's really easy to see what happens here. He's they're going to reach back and touch their legs in a second for their exam. And... Um, as they're <laughs> notice that these guys are off and to the left, right? It's just they're clipping through themselves. All these things. This is back to an. Ex this is back to kind of the extreme poses thing, but basically, like, there's just positions that this this system can't solve for as well. And Umbri on the left, they are just a human gumball, like just. Laffy Taffy. I don't know how they do it. Um, but yeah, those extreme poses are tough. Uh, yeah, it looks like he dislocated his shoulder, right? So there's some things you should just try to avoid. And if you know you need to do them, be prepared to do some animation and editing. All right, let's go next. But yeah, basically don't touch yourself. Like if you're trying to boop your nose, if you're trying to touch your stomach, if you're trying to touch your legs, make sure the model is one to one with your proportions. Again, I'm gonna cover what that looks like in a second. I'm pretty sure if I don't, we'll, I'll go back to it. Moonwalk, gotta be heel toe. If you moonwalk, which I cannot do, um, you're gonna stay in place. You're gonna just float in place because you never lifted your toe off the ground. One solution for this is the virtual production system from Rococo. Uh, that uses the Vive Tracker to put you and fix you in a place. So if I did moonwalk, right, my legs would be going, but the Vive Tracker would be moving. So my character's root position would move. The only problem is, is that Rococo's solution for this, Rococo's solution for this is 
bad. It's really, really bad. And uh, we spent maybe a year trying to get it to work. We ultimately started doing it ourselves. And what we realized was is that the data that comes from the Vive tracker is just too poor to be used in a live setting. Um, we found that they shifted and moved in place, and the only way to solve that is to lerp or linearly interpolate between all these different points to try to get it to the center and be a little more smooth, which introduced latency, which introduced more ice skating and everything else. Uh, this is also an example of ice skating. When a character is standing in place and moving around or is moving around, but they're, I can't, I can't ice skate, but <laughs> the idea here is that it looks like they're sliding on ice. Bambi legs. All right, let's go next. But if you do move your heels, it works. <laughs> All right, next one. And I know we're a little over on the lecture time, but we're, we're almost done here. I think we have 110 slides, so we're almost there. All right, uh, cheating, right? Notice that everyone's actually approximately the right distance away. One of the issues with inertial motion capture is it's not fixed in place. I can be standing across the other side of the room, and when I straight pose, I can warp anywhere in the room I want. Right? So one of the ways that we cheat is we create markers on the ground and try to map those to our reset poses at the end of it. Um, yeah, so if you do end up getting people the right distance away, you can interact physically a lot better. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yeah, so the, since the guy on the right is more built to proportion, uh, he also just tracks a lot more accurately because the solver is matching it correctly. All right, next. All right, there are some things you should just say no to with the Digi models. Uh, so he's on his knees, again, back to extreme poses because of the way the knees work. And like, how would a Digi character like kneel, right? Like maybe a werewolf, but the bony knock knee deer, it's just gonna look weird. It's never gonna look right. Uh, but as you notice the character on the right, oh yeah, a good example of bad data too. The arm, straight up and down. This arm, cocked to the back. It ended up that the suit was transmitting the wrong data. We had to reset the suit, we had to reset Rococo, and create a new scene in Rococo to get it to work. And that took a few hours to troubleshoot. All right, let's uh, go to the next slide. All right, so how do we fix all this? Here's what we learned uh, as, as we went through these. Next. We tried capsule physics animation so hard. Like, we, we really did. I went over this a little bit, so I won't spend too long here. But one of the things we found is that when we tried to do full-on physics animation, it would jitter and bounce and shake and be bad. Uh, when we blended it, it would just kind of float and, like, skate around. So is there a way to do it? Yes. We've not been able to figure this part out, so we tried it a different way. Next. Uh, we decided to create bespoke characters. So for every actor, they have their own model, which is back to the facial blend shapes thing we talked about earlier. Uh, we need a fast way of creating them if we're going to onboard new people. So we created a blockout generator. We can measure different parts of the body, like the distance between the shoulder blades, the floor to the iliac crest, etc. And that allows us to create a block out. So that's me on the left, maybe a little thinner than it should be. Next. And uh, that one is Rune, right? So when I get into character and I touch my chest, it's in the right place. We're both 6'2". When I start moving my hand over my belly, there's a few inches that are not on the character's model. So what you notice is that the character looks like he's hitting a capsule, in fact, a very, very big capsule. Um, but when, when he does that, it'll float over. When Rune, uh, the actor that's using it, does it, it's in place. There is no collision. There is no clipping. Uh, and that's because we got it pretty close uh, to the proportions. So with that in mind, next slide. Uh, this is kind of how it looks. It's uh, SOP-based, all procedural. So we dial in uh, the numbers. And then I have another system that adds some base uh, stuff like eyes and teeth and ears and a muzzle. 
and all the things that we can use to finish the block out from an anthro perspective. So I create divots for eyes, I create divots for the ears, and I create a space for the tail. Uh, and if we're not doing a work safe character, uh, all the bits and bobs. Uh, so, um, yeah, we create a block out. Next. Things that we really want to try. Uh, we talked before about um, uh, clipping. Uh, one way to sit and digitigrade is to have digitigrade legs to sit on, right? So if you use fursuit foam, uh, you might actually be able to create your own capsule in reality, and you can shave that fur to look like your, not fur, shave that foam to look like your character. Uh, and then as that foam is shaped, you might have a very small actor or actress, right? Uh, and if you want to add uh, bazonkers, right, and you don't want your hands to clip through the bazonkers, you might have to actually put like a breastplate or something on someone, um, which also goes back to the very cool gender bendy fantasy of being the gender that you want to be in fursuit. How cool is that, right? So lots of fun stuff there, adding peripheral body parts to be able to do that. Um, we also investigated uh, bend sensors and embedding them into silicon sculptures. You can guess why, but uh, next. <coughs> so the other thing we want to try is 3D printing. Um, so I said before, it's hard to boop your snoot. Right? That's because there is no snoot to boop. Where does it go? So if we put an active tracker on the end of the nose and started solving for where that was, we could do a socket connection. I could have my finger and the joint on the end of my finger magnetically go to the correct place, which is one of the ways that we want to solve in the future for the real time uh, stuff. So the trouble is the iPhone has to be a certain distance in front of the face. So what we kind of want to do is maybe have accessories like antlers or ears or whatever, and then have the iPhone be the muzzle length. Uh, the problem is, is that this is a little long for a muzzle. So we're trying to figure out the best way to do it. All right, next. And that's this, that's the cage. So um, this is our friend Drew looking at the uh, the cage here, which I'm actually pulling up now. This is uh, an action cam kind of holster for a... Can I get in front of the speakers? It's an action cam holster. It has a ton of screw, screws for going to uh, camera pieces. So I have an iPhone cover here. That iPhone cover sits in front of my face pretty good. Uh, I left the one piece that I needed to hook it up all together at home. I have literally everything else. Uh, but it all kind of locks in, tightens up, and sits nicely in front of your face. Uh, so this gives me a little bit of space for a big, broad, insane muscular chest uh, and a snoot to boop. So there's screws that I can put in the top, and I can put a little dot, and maybe I can put it back here or wherever. But ultimately, uh, this is a solution that we found. The problem, and the problem we're trying to solve with the cage is that <sighs> motion capture helmets that hold the iPhone, we've been looking at DIY options. They all have been of very poor quality. They break, they snap, the, um, oh, thanks, yeah. The, um, the, the 3D prints break, snap, et cetera. Uh, in order, to get a, um, the helmets are like 1500 bucks is where I'm going with this. They're really expensive. So we've been trying to find alternatives for that. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. All right, believe it or not, we're at the end. We can start doing the lab. So this is the team that we've got. You saw Umbri and Drew in the videos. Just give me one second. So we have a lot of improv actors, writers, thinkers that are, that are helping us here. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge Umbri and Drew and Rune. 
uh, for helping us a lot of motion capture. Uh, Holiday has been helping us with photography and more motion and 2D art. Uh, Wintergreen helped me bring, get all the lab stuff together. Thank you for him. Uh, Daisy has been helping us uh, with photography stage and lighting direction. They are a former kink.com camera person. <laughs> They've worked in the big, nasty building in San Francisco. They have a lot of stories about that, uh, so very interesting. Uh, but helping with, for me, translating lighting, which I know nothing about, and film and cameras and all that into digital. A uh, big thank you to On, who has helped me with um, a lot of the game design. He's a LARPer, so knows all about game design. Uh, Kiyasha and Moxie have been helping me with a lot of the... Oh, also, Holiday did the shirts, so thank you for him for doing that. Uh, Kiyasha and Moxie have been helping me with the website, and Grim has been helping me uh, build engine, uh, build levels in Unreal and doing a lot of collaboration there. So. Could we get a round of applause for my team that have helped me? So all the way back from, all the way back to Colorado, thank you guys for helping me with that. Uh, so I only have a few, uh, a few more slides here that we'll go through. Um, so our current project, the thing we're working on today, the E621 game show, uh, come, oh, am I still talking here? Am I still on red? Okay. Uh, yes, E621 Game Show. Uh, it'll be a live production. Uh, you can buy tokens. We call them spice. You can spend the spice to send us an image on E621. We'll do Furry Feud, which is where uh, you get to guess 10 random tags that we pulled uh, from the image, and you can guess which of these there are next. Uh, and we have other games like Wheel of, For Wheel of Fortune and uh, The Twice is White, which is where you guess over under if Guillemot or Renamon is more popular, things like that. All right, so final slide. Um, I'm going to play kind of a, we're putting it all together now. So the facial motion capture, the hands, and the body. Uh, we're going to uh, ask you to put a little sugar in our bowl. This is Hedwig and the Angry Inch and our performer, Drew.
Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Uh, this has been the lecture portion. Um, the next part should be very interactive and fun and exciting and a lot more hands-on. So uh, while we're here, I don't know if these things work, but they probably won't. Uh, but I think what I can do, hmm, I have another wireless, let's see here. This shouldn't be too difficult. Let's try this. Does anyone know how to turn these guys on? Q&A, right? So if you have any questions, you can shout them out for now. Please, go ahead. Yeah. I will. That's awesome. Awesome. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I, uh, one of the reasons we're very excited to be here is find collaborators. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, it's in the con book, right? Like the name of the, the name of the presentation. I think it has your at in there. Yes, at R-U-X-B-A-T for anyone that wants to get me on, inst on Telegram or Twitter. Thank you. Check, check. All right. So if anyone wants to come up and ask a question, that's fine too. Uh, Neritas, do you want to just run this to the front and give this to whoever wants to ask? Sure. All right. He had his hand up first. Priority. Haptics? Yeah. Haptics for which problem, one more time? For like your, your notes. Yeah. Haptics is a great idea. Um, one of the things that we are using, get my glove on here. So we're using the Rococo Smart Gloves. So these guys take up a little bit of space on the hand. So you can see there's a controller in the back that plugs into a USB power bank. The fingers are free. So if we found a way to put a little, I don't know, Raspberry Pi on the back, connect that to a module. Uh, I love the idea. The reason I like it is that you can do a distance calculation from where your finger is to the hot spot, right? Maybe it's a joint, maybe it's a socket. So if I have a haptic feedback, beep, 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 you boop the nose. It's a great idea. Yeah, we should try something like that. I like that a lot. Other questions? Hi, uh, thanks again for your talk. Um, I was wondering, considering, your, considering the state of your pipeline, are you currently looking at like the new features coming with under 5.1, like uh, muscle deformation, deformation or, um, um, I haven't seen the muscles yet. Procedural uh, rigging, for example, stuff yeah. like that coming out. Is yeah. something you look into, or are you more... We really like the Houdini rigging at the moment, because it's fully procedural, and Houdini, for projects that make under $100,000, is only 200 bucks a year. So, um, and of course, uh, Unreal Engine, for those that don't know, if as, as long as you're not making a game, no royalties, fully free. So if you're doing machinima in Unreal Engine, you never owe them a dime. So a lot of it's kind of based on the cost. For 5.1, muscles, I was unaware they were doing that yet. That sounds really exciting. Yeah, there's lots of cool things coming with 5.1. Like, especially like this production is like huge thing for Epic Games at the moment. Huge. I actually, I work for Perforce, the people that make uh, P4D and Helix. Um, I don't work on those teams. I work for a company called Open Logic, which does open source software support. But we see a lot about Helix coming out, and Epic Games is one of our biggest customers. I don't know why they like that so much. D4D, I don't know. I'm the Open Logic guy, so I'm the guy that uses Git and Git LFS. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Somebody else? All right. 
Oh. I don't remember uh, the, the software that we were using that was Facecap. I didn't say it. It's a face cap on the iOS store, and it transmits over OSC. Yeah. Uh, do you have any, obviously that might be a little way off, but do you have any thoughts on how you would approach that sort of thing? Like with glasses? Uh, or do you mean like literally four eyes? eyes. Literally so eyes. you can start passing this around. This is touch OS, this is a face cap. Um, please return my iPhones. <laughs> we, will, we, will, we will capture you with the find my iPhone feature. All right. I have a few of these. Is that something that you put any thought into that Make faces. Yeah, so um, exciting, weird characters with four arms and four eyes and uh, tails like that. There's a few ways to do it. We're thinking about digital puppetry for the most part. So having someone with an iPad or a, uh, a control that lets us move it around. So I love the idea of somebody else operating a second set of arms. Yeah, and you can, with procedural, right, I can actually, you know what? We can do that, uh, close to do that. We can do it with a skeleton today. We can show the rigging on how that would work. Procedurally, you can combine inputs. So I can have someone walk the legs and someone walk the arms. We can play with that and see what that looks like. You do explicitly say it, but I kind of assume that tails and puppeteering kind of go hand in hand. You had somebody with a tail. Physical, physical interaction. Um, so we do a combination of animation and physically based animation. You want to pass this forward? Put it in front of your face. Blap, blap, blap. Matt, Matt, Matt. Yep. So we have some iPhones going around that have the face capture software. Um, it's 50 bucks, but if you sign into every iPhone with the same uh, email, it's only $50 once. <laughs> so um, yeah, so those are, those are going around. Again, please, please, please return them. Um, I have up front, oh yeah, so more, more, more Q&A, yeah, please. Anybody other questions? No, we should just, at this point, you're on your own. So the stupid question, do you have a very large room? at the moment. Nice. I used to have the rocket book from the very first uh, incarnation as crowdfunding, but uh, that incarnation did not work very well and I retired it. Don't know how the quality of the newer version is. <laughs> it's what we have. <laughs> so I've I heard Noitum is a lot better, yeah. When I tried the job doing it in the garden, it was like a larger scene, so I needed more space. Yeah. And the garden is not flat, and uh, the figure in the end started, wait a second, started to react to a completely flat bottom, but I was moving yeah. up and down, so it did uh, like this right. all the time. Yeah. That was very hard to correct. Yeah. Because I have no real 3D map of the garden. Correct, before. correct. So you, you have a couple of options, right? Um, one would be to do the virtual production so that it tracks your hip bone, right? So if you were to go up and down or over a hill, it would track it like that. Of course, the problem with that is that the Vive trackers don't work very well. One thing that I have thought about is that you can get a very small Vicon system. You won't do human tracking with it, but you could track individual points, which is where you could start skipping the issues with the Vive trackers. So get the smallest Vicon system for four or five thousand dollars instead of a hundred thousand and only track a few points. And now if I put on the end of my glove, come on. If I put a ring, a ring 
with the white dot, with the infrared dot on it, all of a sudden my tracking got a lot more accurate. And with procedural tools, you can combine those. So I think that's what we're gonna end up doing with our next iteration so that we can have more interaction. But our first step is just a freaking launch. It's been three years, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah well, I was looking at the mixed, mixed systems, but uh, Neutron has one, but it is quite more expensive than just the suit. Sure, at sure. At the moment, I just need the suit. I did have the gloves and no face tracking because yeah. I'm not doing it in real time. Thank you very much, yeah. Well, um, as far as uh, animating post-production, um, one thing, uh, what's your final output? Is it, real, is it Unreal? Is it like a render, like Arnold? Cinema 4D. Cinema 4D. Well, it used to be until they had subscription, which yeah. so I'm currently in the transfer process to Blender. Blender, yeah. Uh, I think Blender has a similar AR kit functionality. So one thing I would suggest, uh, the OSC is an open protocol. So you can go into Blender and uh, record the keyframes of the blend shapes. So ultimately, you would just press record on your keyframe recorder, get each piece of data, and combine it. Also, Rococo, if you ever go back to it, has some, has some face capture stuff with the iPhone as well. Uh, other questions? Two in the back. I've got to get all this working so we're not sitting here watching me do that. Where is? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, it is possible to make uh, motion capture in pursuit, uh, and uh, because it, I want to so I want to make motion capture in pursuit yeah. with a costume. I think but so. But you have the pursuit head on your head. It is possible. Yeah, you couldn't do the facial motion capture because you ha that has to be certain distance away from your face, but. Uh, you could certainly put on, these suits are, are very skin tight. Uh, so you could, you could absolutely wear it under ah. a fursuit, no problem at all. Okay, only the face motion capture is not possible. Correct, yeah, you could do the, f the hands and the full body, absolutely. And, full body and you can, you, the, so if everyone remembers the virtual eyes, if you haven't seen the LED eyes that people put in fursuits, um, they obviously don't really track your eyes. I mean, some of them might at this point, but in general, they don't. They're on a loop. So you could play some facial animations on a loop, you know, or do a lip sync or combine it after the fact. So yeah, you could absolutely do that. It could be pretty cool. Yes. Yes. But many Android phones uh, doesn't have. I'm unaware of an Android solution at the moment. Uh, you can do, I think there's a panel on computer vision on Thursday. You can use the output of video to solve for this as well. So I think there are some oh, Android I solutions, know, yeah. Uh, vision, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that would be a way to do that. Okay. I also have a question. Please. Uh, coming back to the half bits. Yeah. Are you aware of the Lucid VR project? Uh, I th I'm <laughs> it's not jumping out in my head. You can go ahead and explain it, please. Okay, someone uh, is trying to make haptic gloves for VR as cheap as possible. Okay. Okay, and Lucid is the software, or it's the... Yeah, uh, Lucid VR, they have a, a driver for it that integrates into Steam VR as well. Uh -huh. So it might be worth looking into that. And it uses the knuckles, or what, what's the hardware it uses? The hardware is, uh, you know these uh, batch reels that automatically retract? Okay. Oh, with the, the yeah, yeah. Flywheel, like a flywheel. Yeah. yeah. Just how far it's nice. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, these these gloves, which are based uh, with the same technology as the suits, the gyro with the magnet, they're pretty good, uh, but they need a lot of power. They need a power bank, and they also uh, need the software, which means that it's locked behind a subscription when they get greedy, and they will, right, one day. Uh, having an open source option for all of this. Wouldn't that just be so ideal, right? 
Yeah, so I'd love to see that project succeed. That sounds really good. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously you can't like abandon your pipeline, but if you start <laughs> a new, uh, would you think about just spending more on a better motion capture or would you go even lower and just like something? Yeah, you know, I think we're, we're at a place now where we're really just waiting for Rococo's software to catch up with the virtual production stuff. We complained really loudly and I think a lot of other people did too. Uh, what we found was that all of their demos were kind of staged. Not in a they faked it way, but that they only did stuff that looked really, really good, right? They avoided all the problems. So a lot of people saw that and were like, hey, we were kind of sold a bill of goods on this. Like we were really expecting it to do something different. Um, so I'm hoping in their new software version they fix some of it. If I had to go back in time and change one thing, um, it would be that we, uh, didn't try so hard with the virtual production. We spent almost a year and a half. Uh, we went into Houdini and started, we built our own virtual production pipeline. Like we went to Houdini and built SOPs and modeled the off. So you asked before, do I have a space for this? We rent an office space in Denver. It's probably the most expensive part of the project. It's about uh, $1,500 a month to have the, the collaboration space. Short aside on this. Um, I was like, hey, let's build a co-working space for queer people in the IT industry and in the art industry and everyone can come in and hang out. And then coronavirus happened and I was stuck in a three-year lease. Literally the month after we opened the office, uh, coronavirus happened. So we're almost out of the office. That's nice. I've got a whole bunch of empty space in my house. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Naritas? Yeah. It's uh, we built it ourselves. So there are I have uh, a bunch of virtual servers in Vulture, which is a hosting platform separate from AWS, but a lot like AWS. We've built a uh, Telegram bot which reads our chat and invites people and lets them buy spice and runs our interactive games. We can take chat uh, chat messages from the chat and put them in our virtual space. We take stickers. So every time someone posts a sticker, we get a copy of that sticker and can display it in various ways in our game. Um, we can have polls where people vote on certain things, the way things happen. Um, yeah, things like that. So people can put voice messages in and we can play them like a call-in show. We have a bunch of flexibility there. Platform-wise, um, we can't fill 24-7 content, right? So what we really want to do is expose our payments platform uh, so that people can use the tips so that other people can come on and stream. Maybe they're doing art streams. Maybe they're doing um, something very similar to what we're doing, but in their own way. We really want to create a streaming platform for furries where uh, we can do whatever the hell we want without demonetization. So our first uh, strategy is to make our little project fun and successful. And if anyone else wants to come along with us, we're happy to collaborate both on our project and on the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a DIY, not as $100,000. Right. As yeah. A lot. Uh, so every, every time we end up doing DIY, we get really close, and then it's like, <sighs> I, we just want to work on the project, right? So in my experience, there's tooling and tech art, and then there's uh, everything that that's supporting. And we had to balance it. At the end of the day, we only have a few people that are really doing 3D and tech art, and I'm the main tech artist and the web guy. So I was really being pulled in a lot of directions. So ultimately, we just decided to keep it simple so that when we do start getting more people that are really more, uh, that can focus more, uh, we can utilize their stuff a little better. Uh-huh. Yeah. Question was sort of given like the DIY, but right. do you think you could use, you could integrate 
other simpler methods like optical or tactile sensors yeah. to create a sort of a calibration to yeah. drift. Yeah. Um, yes. So originally we were doing it with the Vive trackers. We had a Houdini SOP network that would track the individual dot of the Vive tracker and fix root motion. It worked okay, but like we had this maybe another four or five weeks of work that we'd need to put into it to really do it. The problem I ran into was, is we're all volunteers at the moment. So I had to get people into the office, into the suits, into a room, which was hot, our AC is broken. And uh, so everyone's frustrated, everyone's sitting there like waiting to do the thing, and I'm just sitting there on the computer, try now, try now, try now. And it's like, people only have so much patience for that, and uh, ultimately I just got, I personally just got frustrated. I didn't want to, uh, that sounds bad. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I got frustrated with it, to be perfectly honest, and uh, most of it was around Vive. So I want to try again with optical, with true optical. I think that'd be good. All right, thanks. Yeah. I'm getting Houdini and all my other stuff launched here. We're going to go into it in a second. Lab is starting very soon. Please. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I've seen a bunch of reflections on in, in VR and 